Now we are coming today to the second chapter of Zechariah, and we have already seen the ten visions that are given. And of course, most expositors say eight visions, but we made a division in the first chapter between the four horns and the four skilled workmen. Our carpenters, as our translation has it, some call it artisans, They consider that one vision. I consider it two visions, and for that reason, why we call it ten visions. Now, that brings us to chapter 2, and this is the vision of the man with the measuring line. And let me read verse 1 of chapter 2, and this is the fourth vision. He says, "...I lifted up mine eyes again and looked." Now, I call your attention to this. He's not asleep. He sees this with his physical eyes, so he couldn't be asleep. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. Now, I want us to note what this really means, and I want to turn to other references we have of the measuring line. Over in Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 38 and 39, I'd like to read those. He says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the city shall be built to the Lord from the tower of Hananiel unto the gate of the corner, and the measuring line shall yet go forth over against it upon the hill Garib, and shall compass about to go at. In other words, when you find God using a measuring line, it just simply means that he's getting ready to move again in behalf of that which he's measuring. Here, it's the temple and Jerusalem. And we had Haggai with the temple. God was moving again. This man carried a measuring stick around with him, a yardstick. Now we have in the vision that he saw, here was this man. And I think that's very impressive to note that it's the man with the measuring line. Now I want to turn over to Ezekiel, another reference in the 40th chapter of Ezekiel, beginning with verse 2. I read, "...in the visions of God brought he me into the land of Israel, and set me upon a very high mountain." by which was as the frame of a city on the south. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand, and a measuring reed. And he stood in the gate. And the man said unto me, Son of man, behold, with thine eyes, and hear with thine ears, and set thine heart upon all that I shall show thee, For to the intent that I might show them unto thee art thou brought hither. Declare all that thou seest to the house of Israel. Now that then is the vision. I'm not going to read any more, but if we did, we'd see it's a vision of the building of the millennial temple in Jerusalem. You see, God uses this. And then there's something else to keep in mind here. The appearance of this man reveals that he is the angel of the Lord. He is the pre-incarnate Christ. And he's revealed to us here in Zechariah as the man. And that is important for us to note, and we will note it later on. Now, one further reference relative to this measuring line. Over in Revelation, the 11th chapter, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading now. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months." Now, we won't go into detail there other than to say that here is, again, the measuring of the temple, the millennial temple that is to be 
built so that what we have before us, and it's becoming quite obvious when we move into chapter 2 here and see this vision that you have in prophecy given the rebuilding of the temple and the city in Zechariah's day. That is, the remnant is to return. But that does not in any way conclude the prophecy. Just as you have in Haggai, looking down to the very end times, and that is true of all the other prophets, they see the rebuilding of Jerusalem, and that land during the millennium is to be restored, and the desert will blossom as the rose, and there's a whole lot of desert over there to blossom, my friend. And then the city of Jerusalem is to be rebuilt. And I think that when it's rebuilt and the Lord moves in there, that I'm going to like it. I don't like it today, but I think we'll all like it then. We're not going to live there. The new Jerusalem is where the church will be. Now, will you notice that he is describing in this chapter that we're entering, as he has before, not only the local fulfillment, but down through the ages, the fulfillment that will take place at the time of the millennium. Because Jerusalem is to be inhabited, and it will become the center of the earth. God makes it very clear that the Lord is going to do this. He's already said back in chapter 1, verse 17, "...my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and the Lord will yet have mercy upon Zion." and will yet choose Jerusalem. And so we're looking down now to the future, to that which is down there in the future, so that everything that they're doing now locally and in the immediate future has eternal significance, and that they are to understand God is not through with them at all. And this man with the measuring line here is none other than the angel of the Lord. It's none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, a man whose name is the branch, as Zechariah will say later on. Well, that branch is the branch of David, the sprout that's coming from Jesse. That is the picture that's given to us here. Now let me read verse 2. Then said I, Where goest thou? In other words, Zechariah was interested, where in the world are you going with the measuring line? Then said I, where goest thou? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth of it and what is the length. Now, I think all of this has great significance. He's saying here that the city is to be expanded and it's to grow. And it certainly did in that day and it certainly is today. It's spilled over the walls long ago, and on every hill around there, they're building today. But don't misunderstand me. I don't think that's the fulfillment of this prophecy. This is looking down to that which is yet future. Those people could still be driven out of that land and scattered again, and that would not disturb God's Word one bit, or the fact that He eventually and finally will bring them back to that land, for that is exactly what he intends to do. Now, we have here in verse 3, "...and behold, the angel who talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him, and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited like towns without walls, for the multitude of men and cattle in it. And, of course, the walls of Jerusalem today are just around, actually, the small Arab city, the old city. And most of the city is outside of the walls, as I've said, scattered on all the hills. And that will be true in that day. But it won't be needful to have walls because, number one, with modern warfare, they wouldn't afford any kind of protection at all. And, number two, they will be dwelling in peace in that day. And that means that the Prince of Peace will be reigning in Jerusalem. Now he says in verse 5, "...for I, saith the Lord, will be unto it a wall of fire round about, and I will be the glory in the midst of it." Now, that certainly is not true today. 
It's American planes and American help that's been the protection to that land. But God says he'll be a wall of fire around them in the future. What does that mean? That means God will protect them. And my friend, when God protects them, that's going to be miraculous. Now, God says that I'll not only be the protection around the city, but God says that I also intend to be in your midst. In other words, the Shekinah glory would be back in the temple. And that certainly was not fulfilled in that day in any way at all. It's the same thing he's saying here that God said to Abraham after he had delivered Lot. God says, I am thy shield. I'm your protection. I think that Abraham was frightened in the battle because I think that his life was in danger. And he says, I'm thy shield. God said, I'll protect you. And I'm thy exceeding great reward. Now, that simply means God will make good all that he's promised. And so he's saying that to the city, I'm going to be the glory in the midst of you. And that is when the Lord Jesus comes and enters the millennial temple. Now, that picture has been given to us in another apocalypse in Ezekiel. Remember we said that Daniel and Ezekiel and Zechariah and Revelation are four apocalypses in the Bible. And they all look down to the future when the kingdom is to be established here upon the earth. And we have here Ezekiel. And I'm going to quote here an extended section because I think this is rather important. It's from the 43rd chapter of Ezekiel. Now, here's the glory that is coming. What do he mean by it? Well, listen to this. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters. This is the coming of the Lord Jesus. This is the coming of the Messiah into the temple. And he's coming from the east. And that's the reason that that eastern gate is so prominent today, though sealed up. And all of the graves that are there, my, there are many Muslim graves too, by the way, but all thousands of Israelites are buried there in the Kidron Valley on both sides, up on the side of the Mount of Olives there. And why? Because this is going to be fulfilled someday. And his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision I saw by the river Kibar. And I fell upon my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house, and the man stood by me, and he said unto me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Now, that's a long time, forever. You see, this is not a prophecy in Zechariah or Ezekiel that finds its fulfillment and its interpretation in a local happening. It looks down through the ages to the millennium, to the time the Lord Jesus will come and establish his kingdom. And he says, "...and my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile." Now, that's Ezekiel 43, 1 through 7. Now, here, briefly, he says, "...for I, saith the Lord, will be unto it a wall of fire round about." and I will be the glory in the midst of it. Now, that's verse 5. Now, verse 6. Ho, ho. Well, we saw that last time, and actually what that literally is doing is calling particular attention to the fact that he wants them to 
pay particular attention. In other words, one hole would be enough. Well, when you got a double hole, it's to arrest their attention. And he's giving something that's very important here. And it's a warning at this place because he says, "...come forth and flee from the land of the north." Now, that means get out of Babylon. Why? Babylon was going to fall. God was going to bring it down. In other words, let me revert back to the two visions about the horns and about the carpenters. That first horn is Babylon. And now the carpenters come in and go and take it down. And that'll be Media Persia. But Media Persia will become a great power, a horn. And then they will persecute God's people. And then God will move them off the scene by bringing in another carpenter. And that carpenter will be Greece. And then Greece will be a proud nation. And believe me, under a ruler that came out of the division of the empire of Alexander the Great, there came uh, Titus Epiphanes, uh, how he persecuted these people. And then God raised up another carpenter, and he came and cut down this power, and he became a world power. That was Rome. Now, where's the carpenter to cut down Rome? Rome fell apart, but it's going to come back together again. Who will put it down? Well, the Lord Jesus is going to come from heaven. He's the carpenter of Nazareth, remember? And he is the man with the measuring rod. And he'll put down the Antichrist and his kingdom and will establish his kingdom here upon the earth. Now, that's the picture that's given to us here in these visions. They are of utmost significance, as you can see. Now, let me move on here. He says, Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, saith the Lord. In other words, God says, actually, come back to the land, but I'm going to spread you throughout the four winds, that is, to the four corners of the earth. And that's exactly what he did after that. Verse 7, Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. In other words, get out of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath he sent me unto the nations which spoil you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. Now, that is an unusual expression. It occurs, I think, a couple of other times in the Scripture. And it refers to these people that touch you, the apple of his eye. Well, what's the apple of an eye? Well, an apple, I think, actually is an orange in that land. They didn't grow apples there. They did grow oranges. And an orange is a very attractive sort of fruit. On a tree, an orange stands out in the green leaves. It's just like a sore thumb stands out. Oh, it's much prettier than a sore thumb. But it really is out where you can see it. And God says, you are just that prominent and important to me. Now, don't tell me that God's going to be blind to the apple of his eye. He just simply is not going to be. Verse 9, For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be spoiled to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. In other words, these people were going to get an assurance that God had sent this young man, Zechariah. Now, will you notice verse 10? And he says, Sing and rejoice. O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Now, here is one of the great prophecies, friends, of Scripture. One of the great prophecies of Scripture. Now, with this verse, how can anyone say that God is through with these people, with the nation Israel? How can anyone say that? And how can anyone just up and appropriate what God is saying to these people, O daughter of Zion? Well, Zion is a mountain over in that land. 
England doesn't even have a mountain at all. There's none there. And how would you relate it to the United States? We have plenty of mountains. Now, I know that there are several places in this country called Zion. The only problem with that is God never called them Zion. But he did call Zion in Israel Zion. And when he says Zion, I don't think he's talking about Illinois or Utah or any other place. He's talking about that land over there. There is a danger, and I would call attention to that here, of taking these prophecies that were given to this nation and relate them to us today by way of interpretation. Now, you can by application because there are great principles stated here. But when God is talking about geography, he means that. Now, somebody says, but this is a vision. Granted, but a vision is a vision of reality. A friend of mine tried to explain away the book of Revelation. He disagreed with my interpretation, and he came and he said to me, it doesn't mean that. I said, then you tell me what it means. He says, it's a symbol. I says, it is? All right, now I said, you tell me what it is a symbol of. Oh, he says, just a symbol. I says, don't you know that a symbol has to be a symbol of something? And it has to make sense? You can't just pull out of the air like a magician your own understanding. You can't reach down in a high hat and pull out a rabbit and say, well, this is what it means. How do you know what it means? It's a symbol of something. And you're to determine then what it is if you think it is. But when God uses a geographical term like Zion, he's talking about Zion. And he's talking about O daughter of Zion. Now, the daughter of Zion would be the nation Israel. That is a very familiar figure for them. And it can't mean any other people. And it does mean those people. Now, may I say this? It does not mean the church, and it does not mean Great Britain or the United States. Zion means Zion. No, it's amazing if you just let the Bible say what it wants to say. You know, the Scripture's being poured through some very peculiar funnels, if you ask me. And, of course, I know some people think this is a peculiar funnel that you're listening to right now. But test it by the Word of God. That's the only way you can do. No prophecy is of any private interpretation. You have to put it alongside others, and it must make sense. If it doesn't make sense, then it's certainly not the Word of God that you're giving. All right. Notice this. He says, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Now, that means exactly what it says, that God intends to come to Zion. And that's a geographical spot on the earth, and a certain group of people will be there. And actually, I don't think it'll be Arab. It'll just happen to be those that are the daughters of Zion. That's the nation Israel. And I don't believe that it can be twisted, distorted, and made to mean something else. Because I don't believe that it means something else in any way whatsoever. Now, if you'd refer to the second chapter of Isaiah, you'd find out that it parallels this passage of Scripture. And let me read, therefore, verse 11. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. Now, not only Israel, but many nations. And they shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. They certainly don't know that today, but they will know it in that day. And the Lord shall inherit Judah as his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Now, this ought to answer once and for all the question. The Lord shall inherit Judah. Now, who are we talking about? We're talking about Judah. Now, those today that have a bitter and acrimonious anti-Semitism in their hearts, and always like to say Judah refers to Jews, and that Israel is something else. Did you notice what God said in this passage of Scripture here? 
and the Lord shall inherit Judah? That ought to be the answer to the anti-Semite. God says he intends to inherit Judah. Now, Judah is Judah. <laughs> and as his portion in the Holy Land. And by the way, this is the only place in the Bible where the term Holy Land is used. Now, it's not the Holy Land today. I have made that statement on radio. I've made it in giving many messages around over the country, and generally it's challenged. Somebody says, well, that is the Holy Land. That's where Jesus walked. May I say to you, friends, his footprints are all gone. They're not there anymore, and he's not walking there right now. He will someday, and when he does, it'll be the Holy Land. But it's not the Holy Land today. It's anything but holy. And in the Holy Land, and he shall choose Jerusalem again, which means he's not choosing it right now. And i go along with that. I wouldn't choose it either right now. But when he chooses, it's going to become the capital of this earth. Now, again, may I say that if you can't put Scriptures down for the side of this, then I think that you're in trouble. Now, you go over to the second chapter of Isaiah and listen to this. Verse 2, Isaiah 2, "...it shall come to pass in the last days..." Now, we have moved out to the last days. "...that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law." and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, friends, that's looking forward to the millennium. God is not through with these people. Many nations will be chosen at that time. Now, will you listen to him? The Lord shall inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and shall choose Jerusalem again. Now, verse 13, the last verse in this chapter. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord... For he is raised up out of his holy habitation. In that day, the whole earth will keep silent. Won't that be wonderful? We talk about freedom of speech, and there's going to be a marvelous freedom of silence in that day. Won't hear a thing. Why? Because God is in his holy temple. That looks forward, friends, to the millennium that's coming on this earth someday. Now, with that prospect for the future... That ought to be an encouragement to these people in Zechariah's day, which it was. It ought to be an encouragement to us today that God has a plan and purpose for each one of us. And he's working in your life and my life. Don't fear God. He's working in your heart, both to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Oh, to be in step with him today. Or to be going the same direction he's going. Now, friends, we come to the third chapter of Zechariah. It's only ten verses. You will know today we are in a highly figurative section of the Word of God. We're dealing with the ten visions of Zechariah. He had them all in one night, but they weren't dreams, as we have shown that his eyes were wide open, because again and again he says, I looked and I saw. And so this is not a dream that this man is having. But these different visions he had have a very definite meaning, and I think that they should be looked at together. That is, they should all be considered together as focusing on one particular message, and that we need that overall viewpoint that gives us a perspective of what these different visions are attempting to tell us. And we also need other prophetic scriptures because Peter made it very clear, no prophecy is of any private interpretation. You don't interpret it by itself. You have to put together the whole program of prophecy, and you need to get the overall viewpoint which reaches from eternity to eternity 
in the future. Now, I want to read. And he showed me Joshua. Now, this wasn't a dream again, you see. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, may I mention several things before we get into the text itself that are introductory but very important. He showed me Joshua. Now, Joshua was the high priest, as he's labeled here. And Joshua is not the Joshua that led the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's actually the Joshua that was with them after the Babylonian captivity and was with them in the land. His name means, actually, Jehovah saves. And in the New Testament, it is the same word as the Greek word Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. So the name is very suggestive, highly, I think, significant. And now the other thing for us to note here is that we have a reference to Satan again. And as I've indicated before, we're saving until we get to the book of Revelation. But there is one thing that is quite obvious, that if this man, Zechariah, saw Joshua, then he also saw Satan. And this simply means that he is a person and he is a reality. The interesting thing is Satan had been pretty much dropped out of the vocabulary of most people in so-called Christian lands for the past, well, 50 years. They had forgotten all about him, and they hoped they had gotten rid of him just by not mentioning him They felt like he'd go away, but he hadn't gone away. Very much of a reality today, and there is a turning toward the supernatural, and unfortunately, it's to Satan and the demons rather than to the Lord Jesus Christ and to God. But I think that the pathway will finally lead to the fact that you have to have, and modern thinking demands that evil be incarnate, that it be represented by a person. And they've gone off into demonology today. Then not only evil, but good must be represented. And good, you take out one of the O's, good is God, and God is good. And therefore, God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, will be the final answer to men who are seeking for a solution to their own lives and that of the world. Now, the third thing that we would like to mention here is a vision that goes beyond Joshua the high priest. We are going to see that what we have here is really the answer to a problem. And the problem is simply this. We've had so far that God is going to turn again to the nation Israel. He's going to restore them to the land. He hasn't yet, but he says he's going to, and that he's going to bless them in that land. Well, in that day, they were far from God. They were in sin. And today, the same thing is true. The land, as we saw last time, is only called one time in Scripture the Holy Land. And it'll never be the Holy Land until the Lord Jesus comes. It's not a Holy Land by any means today. But that God intends to forgive them their sins. And how in the world, as Dr. Unger has stated it, a crucial question arises. How can an infinitely holy God accomplish such plans, that is, of restoring these people to that land and blessing them since they are a sinful and besmirched people? How can the wondrous manifestations of divine mercy to them be consistent 
with God's righteousness. All right? The explanation, I think, is found in this, that this man, Joshua, is now going to represent the nation. And we're going to find him, as we read, we're going to find him clothed with a filthy garment. He's dirty. Now, the one thing that the high priest must be, he must be dressed spotlessly. He cannot serve God. Now, how could these people be accepted since they're sinners? Well, this chapter is going to give us the key to that. And these people that went about, as Paul says in Romans 10, 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, the righteousness of God will be revealed in this chapter. How that God can accept sinners. Jesus died for all sin. And if you want to come to him right now, I don't care who you are or what you've done. You may be worse than Karl Marx and Joe Stalin, but you can come to Christ. Either one of those men could have turned to Christ, and he would have accepted and received them. But they'd have to come. To him, by the way. And they would find that for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Romans 10, 4. So that it doesn't make any difference who you are. You can come to God through Jesus Christ. Now, that's going to be highlighted in this chapter here. Now, Joshua is just an individual, and he certainly was not a perfect individual. But he was God's high priest. And he is dirty and filthy. And that might have been true of him personally. I do not know. But I do know this, that he represents the nation Israel. And to begin with, he is, as high priest, the representative of the nation. On the great day of atonement, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies for the entire nation. And just as Christ is today, our representative represents the corporate body of believers, the church before God today. And therefore, we need to see this in the larger context of all these visions, you see, that this man is a prophetic picture of the nation Israel. And that will deliver us from a very limited interpretation. Now, this man is a representative of the nation. And Leupold, one of the great scholars of the past, has said this, he, that is Joshua, represents and practically impersonates Israel in his holy office. For the nation he prays, for it he enters the holy place. He bears the nation's guilt. We must therefore not refer the issues and implications of this chapter to Joshua as an individual, nor merely to Joshua the high priest. We must conclude that his condition is Israel's condition, his acquittal a typical way of expressing theirs, and the words of comfort and assurance given him apply with equal validity to them. And that's a very fine statement, by the way, and loophole's not one you can always follow in his interpretation, but here this is especially good. Now, we know also that Joshua is a symbol, he is a type, he is a representative, and God had chosen him, and God had chosen the nation Israel. And so we can follow this on through and find many parallels that apply. Now, will you notice that we have the nation Israel here? And it is represented by this one man, Joshua. What is said of him could be said of the nation. I think of the novel written many years ago by Nathaniel Hawthorne called The Scarlet Letter. And you will remember it was a study 
that is set in the Puritan days of our country, when, for instance, any woman found guilty of adultery would have an A in flaming red across her bosom. And she had to wear that all the time. Well, you can understand, in that day it'd be a very severe blow. My, today there'd sure be a lot of A's. We may not get any B's or C's, but we sure would have a lot of A's if they did that today. But you remember the little minister was really the one that was guilty. And that finally it was revealed that in his flesh, across his chest, there was an A in flaming red there that revealed his guilt also. And the corollary is just simply this. Joshua is the one, but somebody else is guilty as well as Joshua. The nation Israel is guilty, and that is the picture that's given to us here. Now let me come to the text itself. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now, the fact that he's on his right hand could mean that he's there to support him or defend him or he's there to charge him. And Satan, in his deception, of course, is there actually to charge him. And this is typical of the ministry of Satan. We're told today that we have an advocate with the Father. Why do we need an advocate with God the Father? Who's accusing us up there? Well, we're told that when Satan is finally put out of heaven, that the accuser of our brethren has been put out of heaven. Well, he's the one that has access to heaven today. And I have a notion that he's made a charge against McGee. It's a valid charge. I'm of the opinion that he probably said what others said when I was just in my teens working in a bank in Nashville, Tennessee, and I think I had tried every form of sin that was imaginable at that time. It was a very fast crowd that was there, and I was the last person in the place anybody would ever dream would ever go in the ministry, that had ever become a teacher of the Word of God. And when I felt God had called me, He saved me and called me, and I made that announcement there. I resigned. I wish you could have heard the guffaws that went up. Imagine McGee, and we knew him when, and we know this about him. Oh, boy, may I say to you, I imagine Satan had a busy day that day telling the Lord, well, you'd be very foolish to let him enter the ministry. That fellow, why, he's the last person that in this entire area that ought to go into ministry, may I say to you, he's there to accuse Joshua. And he's saying to God, you don't mean you'd have this dirty fellow on your hand. And he was the accuser of the nation Israel. We'll pick that up in the book of Revelation, that he was there to accuse this nation. He is really an anti-Semite. If you want to know who is the leader of anti-Semitism, it's the devil himself. And this is the picture that we have before us here. Now, will you notice it says in verse 2, And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuked thee. Now, that's very gentle in my book. I think I could think of worse things to say of him than that. But God respects this one that he created the highest creature that he ever created was Satan. He was Lucifer, son of the morning. Now, this one, sin was found in him. What kind of sin? Lust? Stealing? No. Pride it was. He just wanted to rebel against God. He had a free will, and he set that will over against the will of God. And friends, that's sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's sin, friends. And that his own way can be described in certain specific sins, murder, stealing, lying, adultery. All of those, you can name them. 
they come in under the one heading, his own way. That is the problem with man. Now, Satan is here. And the Lord now says, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan, even the Lord who hath chosen Jerusalem rebuked thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now, for just a moment, let's look at this. He says, The Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. And he says, The Lord who hath chosen Jerusalem. So you see that when the rebuke comes, it's not on the count of Joshua, the person, but on account of Jerusalem, the capital of this nation. So it represents the nation. Now it's Joshua, the high priest, who's standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan was standing at his right hand to resist him, to oppose him. Generally, the defense is there on the right hand the one to support you and help you. But Satan's not there for that purpose. He's there to resist, there to make an accusation. And the Lord was the one that rebuked him. And the reason was, God says, the Lord hath chosen Jerusalem. Now, it's true that Joshua was clothed with dirty clothes, And he needed to be cleaned up, not only on the outside, but probably on the end. But he is representative of the nation, because God makes it clear, "...who hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee." In other words, God is saying here that the accusation made against Joshua is he's the representative of the nation. Now, you and I have an accuser of the brethren today, because we are told... John writes and says, "'My little born ones, these things write I unto you that you sin not.'" And I wish we couldn't, but I do. I don't know about you. "'But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous.'" He's the one that's standing here. He's the angel of the Lord. The Lord says, "'The Lord rebuke you.'" (laughs) And why? Because this city, as the capital of the nation, is a brand that's been plucked out of the fire. In other words, it looked as if that city could never be rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity, after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it, and for 70 years it lies in dust and ashes. And then out of that dust and ashes, it's rebuilt again, a brand plucked out of the burning, if you please. It was John Wesley by the way, who, you will recall, called himself a brand plucked out of the burning. And I'm of the opinion that many of us think of ourselves in that particular connection. I know as I look back, it seems to me like an accident that I got saved. It just didn't seem that it could possibly happen. But it did happen. And I know now it was no accident at all. So that It can be said of most any sinner today, we're a brand plucked out of the fire. Now, will you notice verse 3, it says, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Now, there was one thing that the high priest was to be clothed. He was to be clothed with linen, fine twine, byssus, Egyptian white linen, And his undergarments were of this white linen. And over it were the garments of beauty and glory that were placed. Now, I take it here that he's there just as a priest, but a high priest representing the nation. But his garments that should have been clean, they are very much unclean. And it says that he's clothed with filthy garments. Now, very frankly, friends... It's worse than filthy. It actually means that there was excrement on them. There was the awful excrement of human beings on him. He not only was dirty looking, but he smelled bad. You couldn't be any worse than this man was. And actually, here he is with this excrement on the garments, and he's dirty, he's filthy, he smells bad. And that's the way the sins of this nation look to God. How in the world 
can this be remedied, by the way? How is this man or this nation, or how is it possible for you and me to stand before Almighty God? Now, will you notice what he says here? And he answered and spoke unto those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him, and unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. Now, here is without doubt one of the most beautiful pictures that we have in the Old Testament. And this man, he just couldn't stand before God, a righteous, holy God, with these dirty garments on. And it also revealed his weakness. You see that when he's dirty and filthy as he was, it gave Satan a halt on him. It gave him an advantage because as the adversary, he could point his finger And my friend today, my feeling is that it's not the sin of the lost world that is before God that is as terrible as the sin of believers. The devil doesn't even mention the sins of the world, but he sure will be after you, my friend, if you as God's child drop into sin. And that's the reason it's so tragic. When a child of God drops into sin, it causes the world to become skeptical and cynical. You can't blame them. And it gives the devil an advantage over the cause of Christ. And it means also that God can't accept you, friends. You see, if you're a child of God and get into sin, you've lost your fellowship. Now, you didn't lose your salvation, but you sure lost your fellowship, and there can be no joy or blessing in your life. Now, what is going to happen here? Well, this is the thing that's going to happen, and I'd like to change this just a little here. And I want to read verse 4 now in a little different translation. And he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him, saying, Take the filthy garments from off him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with rich apparel. Now, as I said, here is without doubt one of the most interesting pictures that you have in the Word of God. Here is actually the sin of a believer. This man is a priest before God. God appointed priest. Every believer today is a priest before God, but some of us are standing before God in dirty garments. Yes, but somebody says, I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Yes, you are, if you've been saved. And that's exactly the picture that's given to us here. You see, the dirty garments must be removed from him, and then there must be put on him the clean garments. And these clean garments that are put on him represent the righteousness of Christ. Now, this is the picture of your salvation and mine today. And that's one of the things that makes this such a precious passage of Scripture. By the way, let me turn to the third chapter of Romans. Having set before mankind in the first three chapters that man is a sinner before God. We all stand dirty before him. And our righteousness today is filthy rags. We stand like Joshua did. Yes, man is a sinner. Man's clothed with filthy garments. What are we going to do? Well, here is what Paul says in Romans 3, 21. But now, God has done something. Will you listen? A righteousness from God apart from the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and it's like a garment. It's by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
being justified without a cause by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ. Why? Because he died, shed his blood, that it might be possible for you to come in our filthy rags to him. Our righteousness is that, even the best of us. And he takes that off. He'll not accept it. And he clothes us with the righteousness of Christ, that you and I might stand before God clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And when we stand like that, my friend, nobody, no created thing can bring any charge against God's elect. Listen to Paul in the 8th of Romans, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? Yes, and what can you say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, that is, without a cause, give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It's Christ that died, yea, rather that's risen again, who's even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. We have a Savior today. And when we trust him as our Savior, he not only takes from us our sins, removes the dirty garment, but he puts on us the robe of his righteousness, and no one can bring any charge against God's elect. But wait a minute, can God's child get into sin? Yes. Then what is the child of God to do? Well, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. That means you don't go back into the mud. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when you and I are out of fellowship with God, we've lost a great deal. We've lost all joy in our life. We've lost all power in our life. We have also lost, I think, our assurance. I'm of the opinion that there's many a person today lacks the assurance because of sin in their lives. And certainly, we're not serviceable to him anymore. He's not using us. You see, Joshua, if he's to stand before God as God's high priest, he must have on clean garments. And God provided those. How? By mercy. Because, you see, there was a mercy seat there. And that mercy seat, as we're told there in the third chapter of Romans again, that he is the propitiation for our sins. What is propitiation? Mercy seat. He's the mercy seat for our sins. Now, if you have any objection to God choosing the nation Israel, he has. Are they attractive? No. He didn't choose them for that reason. I think probably very unattractive. And you ought to know me, by the way. He certainly didn't choose me. Ruth could ask of Boaz, Why have I found grace in thine eyes? Well, I could tell her why she did. She's beautiful. She has a wonderful reputation. And all I'd have to tell her, You go home and look in your mirror, sweetheart, and you'll find out why he fell in love with you and why he's extended grace to you. You're lovely. Now, don't tell me to look in the mirror. I've already done it. And what I see, sinner, friends, may I say to you, I need to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Now, let me move on, because this is a tremendous chapter, and it has the interpretation for the nation Israel. But again, the application for us today is so beautiful. Verse 5, And I said, Let them set a clean turban upon his head. So they set a clean turban upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Now, I think this is something that is just a little something that's added that's quite beautiful. Now, the garments of the high priest had included a turban that he was to wear. And on that turban, it was in Hebrew, holiness unto the Lord. And don't you see that this man didn't have a turban? <laughs> because he certainly in those dirty garments is not holiness under the Lord. But this is just something added. 
holiness unto the Lord. The turban is given to him now, and it will have on it holiness unto the Lord. He's going to be used of God now, just as this nation in the future, after the church is removed, will be the witnesses for God, and then in the millennium, they will be the priesthood, the entire nation, a priesthood down here upon this earth, just as the church is a priesthood of believers today. Let me keep reading now. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among those who stand by. Now, I think the interpretation there is quite obvious. He says to Joshua, you're dirty. <laughs> he says to the nation Israel, you're dirty. Now, I have a redemption. And that redemption will enable me to extend my grace and mercy to you. And I'm going to save you. Now, if you want to be used, though, you're going to have to stay clean. You're going to have to walk in my ways. You will have to be obedient unto me. Now, he's not only saying it to Joshua, he's saying it to this nation. He's not only saying it to this nation, but he's saying it to you and me today in the New Testament, is he not? That if you love me, keep my commandments, he says. If you want to enjoy and rejoice in the love of God, my friend, you're going to have to be obedient to Christ. There's no other way. This idea today that somehow or another I'm saved by grace and I'll do as I please. If you do as you please, you're not saved by grace because that's too inconsistent. They don't go together. If you've been saved by grace, you'll want to please him because he said, if you love me, and certainly you're going to love the one who's died to save you. And if you've really accepted him and truly trusting him, you're resting upon him. And if you're resting upon him, my friend, you'll want to walk in his way. You'll want to be obedient unto him. You'll want to do what he wants you to do. Couldn't be any other way. Now, will you notice? Here now, verse 8, I'm reading, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows who sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Now, this is a figure and a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a marvelous picture. And I take this as being the sixth vision that's given to him here, because now this is altogether different. I will bring forth my servant, the branch. And it's a familiar figure of Christ, and I'm not going to take the time today to look up the many passages that we could look up, but this is a picture of the one who came as the branch. And you will find that Isaiah spoke of the one who is the branch. You will remember that there would be a root out of the stem of Jesse, and that is the branch. And he is to be the king. He is to be the ruler. The branch sets him forth as the Savior. It sets him forth as the one who protects and keeps his own. And the branch represents him as the coming king to this earth. Now, he says, For behold, the stone that I've laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the engraving of it, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. What we have here is the picture of Joshua, the high priest, and Satan before him. And the fact that the one who's coming is the branch. He is the Savior of the world. But not only that, the branch here is the stone, the stone that Daniel talked about, cut out without hands. And it has eyes in it, we're told, seven eyes. Seven is not the number of perfection, but the number of completeness. He has complete knowledge, and I speak of wisdom and knowledge. The Lord Jesus Christ has been made unto us wisdom, because he is all wisdom, if you please. We have here, for behold, the stone that I've laid before Joshua. 
Now we're speaking of the second coming of Christ. The branch shear and the stone represent the second coming of Christ to the earth. For he saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Has that happened today? No, it certainly has not happened in our day. It is yet to happen. When the Lord Jesus comes, it'll be removed in one day. And in that day, now that day is the day of the Lord, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. In other words, they'll be dwelling in peace and enjoyment in that day. But that day has not yet come for them. What a picture that we have here and what a vision this man had. Now, friends, we've come to the fourth chapter of Zechariah, and we've come here to, frankly, a very interesting vision. We have the vision of a lampstand and two olive trees, and this is quite a remarkable vision that's given to us here. Now, as we get into this chapter, I'm sure by now many of you who are following us in this study that you have discovered that these very remarkable visions that have already been given to us, and now we actually come to what I've labeled the seventh one. We had the riders under the myrtle trees, the four horns, the four smiths or carpenters, and the man with the measuring line, and Joshua and Satan, and then the branch and the stone with seven eyes in it, and then the lampstand and two olive trees is the one that we come to now in chapter 4. So that we've had several rather remarkable visions here. But by now, I'm sure that you're beginning to see that a story is being unfolded to us here and that it is a rather remarkable story, by the way, that we have seen at the very beginning, those first few visions showed that God was delivering his people out of the slavery and oppression of Babylon, and that he was bringing them back there to the land, and that was a great comfort to those people in Zechariah's day. But it also looked on down to the end times when again they'll be scattered throughout the world as they are today and that they are finally to be regathered in that land when the Lord Jesus brings them into that land. We saw last time a very important vision and that was this man that was the high priest, Joshua was his name, he had on dirty garments. And immediately Satan could challenge him. And he had to have his garments changed. He had to have that which was white and that which was clean put upon him. Well, that immediately tells out the story that these people are brought back to the land for a purpose, but they can't be used in their sin. They will have to be clean. And they can't clean themselves, and religion can't clean them. And therefore, there has to be cleansing coming from the outside. And that cleansing, of course, as Isaiah had put it, "...come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool." And Joshua had his garments changed. He couldn't stand in his own righteousness. Our righteousness is filthy rags in God's sight. So you and I have to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and that is spotless. That will enable us to stand before God, and that would enable Joshua as the high priest to serve God, you see. Now he is made inwardly ready for service. There must be that cleansing which actually is salvation. We are not redeemed with corruptible things, not with silver and gold, but we've been redeemed with the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the way that you and I are redeemed before God today 
And it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And so this man was cleansed. And somebody says then he's ready for service. Not quite. We come now to this vision of the golden lampstand. And this is going to show how he is to fulfill the office, not by his own power at all, but by the power of the Spirit of God, and that he can then become the light of the world, and this nation can become the light of the world. And today we are told that the church is the light of the world. The Lord Jesus said to his own, you're the light of the world. He came as the light of the world, but he's left. But the church can't do it with its own power. There has been an energy shortage in the church for a long time. And we need to have direct contact with the supply of oil. There's been a shortage of oil today. Well, this is a remarkable vision here. We have the golden lampstand and pipes coming right from the oil well, from the two olive trees, and they're pouring oil into it all the time. The middleman has been cut out of this. There's no rationing of it. There is a generous supply of oil that is given and there's no such thing as an energy shortage. They ought not to be in the church today, but the church has become rather impotent and weak before the world. Why? Because of the fact that we are not going forth in the power of the Spirit of God. So that already before us, we have outlined a story and the stepping stones of God's method of dealing with these people and it puts a principle down his method of dealing with us. And then it looks on down to the end of the age when these people will become, after the church is removed, the light of the world. And they can't do it in their own strength and power. Now, let's come, therefore, to the text and look at it. In verse 1, I read, "...the angel who talked with me again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep." And I must call your attention to this again because it's always been assumed by people even after they read all of these that these were visions given to him in the night and it meant that he dreamed these things. He didn't dream up a thing here. In fact, he is wake out of sleep, we're told. Wakened out of sleep. He had dropped off to sleep because, you see, he's already had six tremendous visions. And that's a pretty good night's work, by the way. And he was working the late shift and the swing shift and the night shift. In fact, he's working all of them. And it's time for him to have a little rest. So after he was given the sixth vision, he dozed off and went to sleep. And now the angel had to wake him up because he's not going to be given this in a dream. He'll see every bit of it. And now we're told twice here... And he waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. So he got this with his eyes wide open. Now will you notice verse 2? And he said unto me, What seest thou? What do you see now? And I said, I have looked. So he used his eyes, you see. I have looked, and behold, a lampstand all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and the seven lamps on it, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top of it. Well, that is a remarkable vision. Now, the lampstand is familiar to us. It is one of the symbols of the nation Israel. There are many symbols of the nation that are used in Scripture. One, of course, is the burning bush that Moses saw. One is the vine. Isaiah develops that. And today the Lord Jesus is that vine for the church. You are saved today not by belonging to a nation or belonging to a certain class group or going through a ritual or belonging to some religion or performing some religious ceremony. He is the genuine vine, and it means whether you're joined to Christ or not. Therefore, what does it mean to be saved today? It means to be in Christ 
and you get in Christ by trusting him as your personal Savior. So that what we have here now is another symbol. And by the way, the olive tree is also used as a symbol of the nation in certain places. Paul uses it when he speaks in Romans about the cutting down of the wild olive tree and the other one's going to grow and that that olive tree is Israel. So that we have now the menorah or the lampstand. And it's interesting that today the nation Israel in that land is using the menorah, the seven forked lampstand that has the seven lamps upon it. Now, it was one of the articles of furniture in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. And it was, without doubt, the most beautiful piece of furniture that adorned the tabernacle. And there were seven articles of furniture. It was made of solid gold, hand-wrought, bezalel, the artisan, the very skilled artist is the one who designed it. And it was a thing of beauty. It had seven branches three going out on each side from the main stem, and then the main stem made seven branches. And on top, it was like an open almond and a flower. And in that open flower, there was placed the lamps. Now, this was given to the great high priest. He had charge of the lampstand. He would light the lamps in the evening when they would camp on the wilderness March and they were left on because he was continually putting oil in the lamps. And it was his business also to trim the wick and to see that they burn. And you have that same picture in the book of Revelation of the Lord Jesus, our great high priest, walking in the midst of the lampstands, those seven churches. And he speaks again and again, "'If you depart from me, I'll remove your lampstand.'" And he's done it. Those local churches in what is modern Turkey today, there's not a one of them in existence. He removed the lampstand, and there have been many churches since then that he's closed the door of that church. It's no longer an effective church when it's not giving out the Word of God. The light is not shining. Our Lord has a snuffer, and he just snuffs that out, by the way. And it was here a picture that the nation Israel would again become a witness for God in the world. But the interesting thing is that you have something that is very important. In fact, it's all important. It's the oil that's put in the lamp on top. Now, the lampstand speaks of Christ. The lamps with the oil in it speak of the Holy Spirit. I don't suppose that you have a better picture of the Holy Spirit, then the oil that is there. It was Hengstenberg who made the statement. He says, oil is one of the most clearly defined symbols in the Bible. And he makes it clear that he understood it to mean the Holy Spirit. So that the oil is the Holy Spirit and the light that's given out speaks of Christ. You see, frankly, what you have here is one of the most beautiful pictures that you have in the Bible of Christ. You remember he said that when he left, he had sent the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit came, he would not speak of himself, but he would take the things of Christ and show them unto us. Now look at the lampstand. The lampstand held up the lamps with the light in them. And the light, in turn, revealed the beauty and the glory of the lampstand. Just as the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself, but he reveals the glories and the beauties of the Lord Jesus Christ, so that these people are to witness to him and for him someday. And the popular symbol today is the menorah. You don't see the olive tree or the fig tree, or the vine, or anything else. But you do see the menorah. I was over there during their 25th anniversary, and you'd see that menorah painted around in many different places. So that that is the picture that's given to us here. Now, there is something new that's been added here in this vision that you don't have in the instructions for the building of the lampstand and the placing of it in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. 
is the fact that you have above it quite a reservoir or a tank for the gas, if you please. And then each lamp was connected with that. Then the thing that is new, verse 3, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left side of it. Now there were pipes that came out of the olive tree and poured its oil, like golden oil, into this tank. And then from the tank, it went into the different separate lamps there. So this is something new that has been added. Now, the olive trees here are definitely the civil power and the religious power of that day. Zerubbabel being the civil power and Joshua being the religious power in that day. That is, they were the leaders in this particular connection. Now, we have a very beautiful arrangement of these visions that were given to this man, Zechariah. It's almost like just taking certain steps. There are certain stepping stones here. They tell out a story, and they reveal a very beautiful, complete picture when we put them together. And they had a local fulfillment. Zechariah gave these to the people for their encouragement. They had been in Babylonian captivity. They've come out of it. God has made it very clear to them that all of this happened according to the arrangement of God and according to his plan and according to his purpose. But now they've come back to the land. They must be cleansed of their sin. And having been cleansed and brought into a right relationship with God, their sins forgiven, now they can render an effective testimony for God. And that is the picture that is before us. There to be a light in that day. Then it has a local application, not only for them, but for us today. It had an application in the past. It has an application in the present. And it puts down certain great principles for us that God today can't use an unclean witness. Now, I know that there are many that are tempting to witness that are unclean, but that doesn't mean that they are effective witnesses for Christ. They are not. All they build is a big haystack, wood, hay, and stubble, and it'll be tested someday by fire, and we'll find out that there was nothing genuine really done for God. Everything was artificial and superficial. Now, it looks also to the future. And it has its complete fulfillment in the millennial period that God will return them back to that land and that God will cleanse them in that day. In the last part of this book, we'll find that a fountain is going to be open for cleansing for David's offspring and for the city of Jerusalem. Now, God intends them at that time after they've been cleansed that they will again become a light to the world. And that was God's original intention for them. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, verse 8, and I read this, "...when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he separated mankind, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel." Now, why did he do that? Why was it put on that kind of a basis that according to the number of the children of Israel is the way God arranged the nations of the world? Well, because they are to be a witness to the world. That is God's intention, that they will be a witness in every corner and crevice of this world someday. And God has made it that way. Now, they failed in the past, but the church has failed in the present. We've been told to go into all the world, but how many places in the world today do not have a witness? That is one of the things that we have been so delighted with radio. Radio is penetrating today into places where no human witness can get. I think I shared with you some time ago, if I didn't, I should have, a letter that's come to us from South America where a young man 
came to Christ listening to the radio, and he immediately became the preacher to his village. Why? Because there wasn't any preacher there. And he was the only witness in the town. And he became a flaming evangel. He became a light for the Lord in that place. Well, we believe that radio is penetrating out and raising up multitudes today that are witnessing for Christ. So this is a very meaningful verse here. And that's not the only one. Ezekiel, in the fifth chapter, verse 5, he says, "...thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem." I have set her in the center of the nations with countries round about her. Why? That she could be a witness. You see that little land over there. The reason it's such a sensitive piece of real estate is, of course, first of all, because God has chosen it, and he's made it that way. But he chose it because, actually, it's the very center of the three major continents and that is Africa, Asia, and Europe. And it is right on the crossroads of those three continents. And it's a very important piece of real estate, as we have certainly witnessed. There's no place as sensitive as that place is today, and no place has caused any more of a problem than that little spot has caused. Well, God, I think, intended it that way. It's at the very center of things, and there'll be trouble until it becomes a center for the proclamation of the Word of God, because God said in Isaiah that the Word will go forth from Jerusalem. And that is not true, of course, today, but it looks down to the future. Now, in the meantime, you and I are to be lights in the world It has that meaning for us today. So that makes this very important, as you can see, indeed. Now, with that in mind, let me read verse 4. He says, So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Now, this young man, Zechariah, he had no inhibitions. He says, What am I seeing? I see these things. But what's the meaning of it? Now will you notice the answer of the angel, verse 5. Then the angel who talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. In other words, really what the angel is saying to him here is just simply this. He's saying to him, You ought to know. If you don't know, you ought to know what this is. That is something that you ought to be able to understand. You know what you're looking at. It's the golden lamp stand, and you ought to know the meaning of it. And the angel says, Knowest thou not what these are? Or you ought to know what you're seeing. And this man says, Well, no, I don't. No, my Lord, I don't understand it at all. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Now, this is the message that is for Zerubbabel, and we need to keep that in mind, that it has a real meaning for him, and it's a great principle for us today. And here is the message, "...not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts." Now, the word might and power are quite interesting. Actually, the word for might has in it the sense not of physical strength. It has in it more or less what we would call today mental ability, sagacity, that which has to do with a wise decision. So let me change the reading here a little. It's not by brain nor by brawn, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, this was a great encouragement to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the civil ruler. Joshua was the religious ruler. And they are represented in those two trees, the olive trees that were supplying oil to the lampstand. The message is simply this, that it's not going to be by your cleverness, your ability, and it's not going to be by your physical strength, but the temple will be built by the Spirit of God. And friends, if the Spirit of God is not in our enterprise today, 
it'll come to naught. Because God is not carrying on his work by might, that is, by brain or by brawn. We like to talk about this man's a clever man. He's a clever preacher. He gets up very nice little sermons and all of that. But friends, God's work is not carried on that way. I think sometimes the clever man is the dangerous man. The fellow that is sharp mentally can be sharp mentally in the wrong direction and cause a great deal of difficulty among God's people and take a great many in by doing it. There's been a great deal of religious racketeering that's gone on in our day. I stand on the sidelines and see a great deal going on when I actually couldn't lift my voice against it without being misunderstood. Yet it was quite evident that some clever fellow or several clever fellows, they're good backslappers, they are good public relations men, they're good administrators, they have a nice personality, they have a great deal of charisma, and they make an appeal. But God says, I don't carry on my work that way. It's not by the human that God does it. It's not by might nor by power. It's not by brain nor brawn. But God says, it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. So this has a tremendous meaning and it puts down a great principle for us today. It is only what the Holy Spirit of God can and does do through us that God uses today. Or let me be very personal and very frank. Anything that Vernon McGee does in the flesh by my own effort, by Vernon McGee doing it, God hates it. God can't use it. God won't use it. God has no use for it. And it will come to nothing because it's nothing in the world but Vernon McGee building a haystack that's going to ultimately be consumed by fire. Now, he wants to do his work through us. And it'll have to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's important for us to see here. Now, in the future, this is going to be especially true in the millennium. Again, it will not be by brain or brawn, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Baron put it like this. He says, it is in his, that is, Messiah's, light, and by means of the golden oil of his Spirit, which shall be shed upon them abundantly, that Israel's candlestick shall yet shine with a sevenfold brilliancy for the illumination of all the nations of the earth. And that, my friend, is a great statement, by the way, that there will be and there was a remnant back yonder in the day of Zechariah that needed this encouragement because they were overwhelmed by opposition and they were beset by doubts and by fears and they needed some encouragement and this was given. And so the vision is given here. This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. This was to encourage him. God today is not carrying on his work by intellectual entertainment of a congregation, but it has to be by the Spirit of God. And he doesn't do it by just human strength, just brute strength. Now, we find that this vision is of great encouragement and was in that day. Now, let me read on. Verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain? Now, a mountain represents opposition. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone of it with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. In other words, the cornerstone is going to be put in this new temple. It's not a great impressive temple, but they've had all kinds of opposition And now this vision encourages them that he'll be able to move mountains. And you remember the Lord Jesus used it like that. Why, if you say to this mountain, be removed. Well, I don't think it was ever given to remove physical mountains. There weren't many of them moved over in that land, and there are not many of them being moved around 
today except by earthquakes. But the faith that removes mountains is a faith that removes obstacles and opposition to the work of God. And that is the picture here. God's temple will be rebuilt. And what an encouragement it was to these people. And he's told definitely he's to finish the rebuilding of the temple. Verse 8 now, "...moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you." In other words, this was to be for his encouragement, and it was what Paul said, "...being confident of this very thing." that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, Zerubbabel, you put down the foundation. God was with you in putting down the foundation. Well, you're going to put the roof on it too, and God will be with you. Verse 10, "...for who hath despised the day of small things?" Well, I can tell you who has. We do today. We Americans go in for the big and the brassy. We like the thing to be a success story. And so today the successful preacher or the successful church is the one that has the crowds and that sort of thing. And I'm beginning more and more to believe that the Lord is working in a quiet way in quiet places today. And we've learned to despise the day of small things. We need to get back to that, by the way. And I'm afraid that you're listening to a man that might be guilty of that. I get discouraged some days when our mail count here goes down. I say, oh, my. And then I find out on that day when we only had just a few letters that one of those letters was the most priceless letter that we've ever received. May I say to let's quit despising the day of small things. Now he says, for they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. That plummet was a weight on the end of a string, and that's the way you can build a thing, you know, straight with the earth. I wish I had thought of that when I put up a little shed on my place, because it isn't quite straight. Well, you notice this. See, the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. God is still overruling. Then he says, verse 11, "...then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the lampstand, upon the left side of it? And I answered again and said unto him, What are these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these are? In other words, he's saying again, you ought to know what these are. You ought to know what they are. And I said, No, my Lord, I really don't know what they are. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, these are two spirit-filled men, Zerubbabel, the civil ruler, Joshua, the religious ruler. We've already seen he's been cleansed. He now stands in the righteousness of Christ. A new garment has been put on him, and he can now stand before God. Again, may I say, it had a local message. When these people back there confessed their sins and turned to God's redemption, the way that he planned it in that day to bring a little offering that pointed to Christ, and they brought it by faith, they are now cleansed, and they now stand clothed, and they now can be spirit-filled and be used to God. That has a message for us today, does it not? That God wants to fill us with His Spirit. And there are certain conditions to be met. There are two of them I think are negative. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. You can't have a filling of the Spirit if there's sin in your life. God can't use you. And then quench not the Spirit. That's when we're out of the will of God. And if we're out of the will of God, God can't use us. If God wants you in Africa, and if you're in this country, I don't think he's going to use you. But listen, if you're in Africa and you ought to be in this country, he still's not going to use you. Then he says, walk in the Spirit. And walk in the Spirit is a very practical sort of thing. It's just to get up and start out and rest upon the Spirit of God. Now, this is a picture of the future. This looks forward to the day when God will pour out his Spirit without measure. That day hasn't come yet. 
There's very little of the pouring out of the Spirit today, if you ask me. But in that day, he says, I'm going to pour out my Spirit on all flesh. That day's yet future, friends.